So this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice. I will be glad in it. <laughs> I really know absolutely nothing about chess. And um, so um, the one thing I did learn uh, about chess was a lot of years ago, Bill was trying to teach me how to play chess. And I um, um, had a friend that came over while Bill was at work, he just happened to uh, drop in, and um, he said, I can teach you how to beat Bill in three moves. <laughs> and if you do it right, he, you will catch him off guard. So, okay, I learned that. <laughs> yeah. So Bill came home, and we got the chessboard out, and I'm just, no, no, I don't know, I don't know what to do. <laughs> and uh, so I started moving it, and remember the guy said, if you do it right, he, he will be caught off guard. Well, I did it wrong. <laughs> so he was not caught off guard, and he did beat me once again. So, uh, so um, anyway, one thing I do know about chess is that every piece has a position. Yeah. And every piece has a direction that it's to go in. And there are directions that it's not allowed to go in. That's what I know about chess. And so that's how, that, how much we can tie it together. We have been positioned by God in the place that we're at right now. Here in Esther, we see that God positioned his people where he wanted them to be. There may be, uh, there may be someone here today that um, you're asking um, if you're in the right position. You're asking if you're in the right place right now. I assure you, you are in the right place. You have been preparing for this day all of your life. You and I have been preparing for this day all of our lives. We are right where we're supposed to be because God himself has brought us here. Um, as I was preparing for this message, I received a, a card from a dear friend of mine, and it said, God has prepared you for this time of your life and has given you everything you need for all he's calling you to do. That's what God is saying to you. God is positioning his people, and he has prepared you for this time of your life and has given you everything you need for all that he has called you to do. You are here for such a time as this. I love the book of Esther. I love, love, love the book of Esther. At this point, if we could just, let's take a deep breath, and as we breathe out, let's say thank you, Jesus. So just... Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. As soon as I say those words, I am reminded of a recent trip that I took on an airplane. As I was on the airplane going into Denver, uh, we hit some turbulence and the plane went, dropped and turned. So my immediate response was to throw up my arm over in front of the man sitting next to me <laughs> because I'm a mom. And then I'm going to protect him. I said, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And I was just like, okay, 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 we're off. So two things happened there. I asked the guy, have you ever been through this before? And he hadn't looked at me at all. Um, no, I've never been quite through this before. No, I haven't. But you know what I found out? I found out in an emergency, in a challenge, what's in me. Right away, I knew to call on the name of Jesus. So let's center in on that particular thing. Um, in our text today, Esther is going through a little bit of turbulence in her life. So she was at home. We've learned so many different things about the book, and I love this book of Esther. I love looking at um, Esther's name means star. Um, I can't remember what Hadassah means, uh, but Esther means star. Haman means rager. 
and Haman was a rager, not a ranger, a rager. And Mordecai plays the part of the Holy Spirit in Esther's life. Um, as we get to these things, we will be reminded of these particular things. So she was at home minding her own business, just living her life, and all of a sudden, her, as you've already heard, her parents had died. She was under the care of Uncle Mordecai, who became her mother, her father, her family. And you know the whole story of the king and, the, and how Vashti was uh, sent out and lost her, her crown. And now the king is boohooing because, oh, I don't have a queen, so let's go. And the other uh, guys say, I got an idea. Let's get all the young ladies. Of course, we have to have the young ladies to do it. <laughs> and uh, we're going to gather them all up, and you can make your pick, and we'll just do it. Oh, well, I don't know. Let me think about that. Okay. <laughs> let's do that. I think that's a good idea. Let's do that. And so they do all of this stuff. And so uh, his friends talked him into how he was to get his new queen. And so Esther was among those beautiful young women who came to live in the king's house. She was put into the custody of Haggai, the keeper of the custodian of the women. Esther was being positioned by God. Why do I say that? I say that because... The book of Esther is all about God's promise that he would always have a remnant of people. And Esther's job was to create that remnant of people, to allow that remnant of people to live. Um, and there goes the thought. <laughs> that was such an amazing thought about that. And, you know, if I just keep talking, I, I know it's going to come back to me. So she was positioned by God so that that remnant, oh, she didn't reveal her that she was a Jew because Mordecai, the Holy Spirit, had told her, don't reveal it. Don't let them know because God's timing is always perfect. She would never have been chosen to come into the castle or, or into the king if they had known that she was a Jew. So God's positioning his people always. By the way, Haggai's name means meditation. She was put in the custody of meditation. Um, meditation means to engage in contemplation or reflection. So God calls us to engage in contemplation and reflection on his word. This, ladies, is God's love letter to us. We need to meditate on them. We need to be memorizing them. We need to put them deep into our heart. We need to have that, that which flows out of us when we're in a situation, when we are uh, faced with talking to someone. That word just comes up. It comes up like that. Have you ever, uh, as I've matured, um, <laughs> I haven't gotten older, I've just matured, um, uh, but uh, I don't remember things quite as quickly as I used to. I can't memorize quite as quickly as I used to. But what I have found is what I have memorized, even though right now I couldn't tell you, you, you could tell me a verse and I would not be able to come up with it probably. But if I were in the situation where that verse was needed, it's there. Yeah. By the Holy Spirit, it's there. So God calls us to be, to have that in our hearts. So she's positioned in the care of Haggai, and it says that she pleased Haggai and obtained his favor, got everything she needed. She even got extra. You see, where God guides, God provides. So in your position right now, where God guides, God provides. You are in the position that God wants you to be in. He's going to make that provision for you. I know in a size, a room this size, there's probably some of us who have a situation where we need God to provide. We need to get God to provide healing. We need God to provide provision. We need God to provide um, finances. We need God for, to provide these things. When we are positioned where God has called us to be, 
we will have everything that we need to accomplish whatever he's called us to do. And you know what, I left, I'm gonna grab this water, I'm sorry. <coughs> there's, there's something about up here. <laughs> it's called panic, <laughs> but um, yeah, so. So Esther got the best place in the house of women. She was anointed for six months with the oil of myrrh. The oil of myrrh, is, it's, its fragrance is beautiful, but it represents death. Death to the old life. Esther will never go back to her old life. Even if she's not picked by the king, she will never go back to her old life. That life is dead, it's gone, it's over. God is positioning her in a place of saving the lives of his people. She doesn't know that yet, but we happen to know that because we read the end of the story. So we get to know ahead of, a, ahead of time. God calls us to put to death that old life. God has called us to put to death that old life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. It's dead. The new has come. And when it came time for Esther to go into the king, she requested nothing but what meditation, what Haggai had suggested that she would need. Everybody else was allowed, they were allowed to request whatever they wanted before they went into the king. She didn't request a beautiful gown. She didn't request a certain potion. She didn't request a certain anything. She said, what do I need? She went to the word of God. We go to the word of God. God, what do I need? We go to the word of God and we get that provision from the word of God and he puts that in our hearts. And so uh, she did what he advised. When he... Uh, when we've been with the Lord, our countenance changes. When we've been with the Lord, our countenance changes. And like Esther, who obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her, we obtain that same kind of favor when people see Jesus in us. Because they can argue with what we say. They can't argue with our countenance. They can't argue with who Jesus is. They can't argue with any of that. We look different when we've invested time with the Lord. When we come into a place of meditation, we've come to that place where we've, we're, we're sitting down at the meal with the Lord and we're just um, consuming all that he has for us. We will look different. Someone will say, you know, wow, I haven't seen you in so long. You look so different. Oh, it's the Lord. It's the Lord that's done it. I look different because it's the Lord. He's changed me. He's changed me into his likeness. Um, and I've meditated on the word. Peter and John spoke so well and with such authority that people were shocked. They were fishermen. These guys were just fishermen. And I don't know if you're watching The, the Chosen. These makes these guys really come to life. How many of you have been watching The Chosen? You've seen it. It really makes them come to life like, oh, yeah, now I get it. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought Peter was like. Yes, they, they're just like that. So they were just fishermen. But in Acts 4.13, it says, the hearers took note of them that they had been with Jesus. They took note of them that they had been with Jesus. That's what God calls us to. There's just something different about worshipers. When Moses invested time in the presence of God, his countenance was different. When we invest time with the Lord, our countenance is different. That's the part of what your, when your father sees in secret, he will reward you openly. That time in secret, he rewards you openly for all to see, not for you to brag, not for people to brag on you, but just that which you, you've invested your time in is now there for all to see. There's power and there's authority in that worship. Esther walked in obedience. 
She walked in obedience. The enemy really hates it when we walk in obedience. The enemy really hates it when we choose to worship God over everything else that's going on. The, wor the most threatening position we have to the enemy is the position of worship. And I want to threaten him. I don't know about you. I want to threaten him. When he stands up and just, you know? <laughs> and that's really what he's doing, you know? We go, oh, yeah, he's so big and he's so... St yes, we need to fear him uh, influencing our lives. But I don't fear him because I have the living God living inside of me. Amen. And I have the Holy Spirit. And so far more than anything we do when we worship God, that's the greatest threat to Satan. And remember Haman's name, who Haman represents the work of Satan in the Jew's life in the book of Esther. Satan is a rager. He will try and try and try to scare us, but we don't have to give in to it. And so Haman, he wants to be worshipped. Mordecai, who I said was the type of the Holy Spirit here in Esther, said, I cannot compromise worship. I can bow to none other but God. When it came down to it, he could bow to none other but God. He refused to do it. He refused to compromise. And when uh, Sonia brought up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I love, we just finished going through the book of Daniel. And I love that story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I love that they were in that fiery furnace. Why do I say that I love that part? They stood for what God told them to stand for. They didn't compromise. There they were in that furnace. The thing that I'm so excited about is that while they were in that furnace, they were in a dome of protection. Jesus being in there with them. But here's the key. They came out of there, and the word of God says, in Daniel, it says, they didn't even smell like smoke. You know what they smelled like? The fragrance of Christ. That's what they smelled like because they had invested time with Christ. They had vested time with God. When Daniel was in the lion's den, when he would not bow, when he would not give in, there he is in the lion's den. We don't have a record of what went on because it's not about what went on there. It's about what God did. And so I believe that when the, the king came and said, uh, Daniel, Daniel, or Daniel, yeah, what do you want? Oh, you want to come in? Uh, uh, oh, oh, you want me to come out there? Okay, I'll come out there. I believe that Daniel spent, invested the whole night in the presence of God. What are lions afraid of? Fire? What would they led through the wilderness? A pillar of fire. I believe that God was there in, the pre in his presence uh, as a fire, protecting Daniel but Daniel comes out different because he's invested that time with the Lord, because he was in there with God. So we know the story. We know the story. Uh, it was uh, said earlier, king, the king and Haman sat down together to drink, and the people were perplexed. Whenever the Christian sits down with the world to partake of it, those looking on are confused by what they see. So that's why we don't give in to the things of the world. That's why we look so much like the world, that you can't tell the difference. That's why, oh, well, we, we, we have to understand. People have to see us, that, you know, be comfortable in their world. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus sat with sinners. 
Jesus ate with sinners, but they, he stood out because he was different. And that's the way that we need to live our lives as well, not being partakers of this world. Like you and me today, Mordecai was grief-stricken when he saw the condition that was about to come on the Jews. He was grief-stricken. Aren't you grief-stricken by what you see today in our world? What are we doing about it? Mordecai went to sackcloth and ashes. Mordecai went to fasting for the Jewish people, for his people. He began to fast and pray, put on sackcloth and ashes, and when Esther learned of it, she sent him clothes to put on to cover his grief. Just be, I want you to be happy. I just want you to be happy. That's all, I just want you to be happy. So let's just cover your grief. Let's not deal with the grief. Let's not deal with the purpose of the grief. Let's just cover it. Pretend like it never happened. She didn't seek the cause of the pain. She just wanted to cover it up and not have to deal with it. And of course, Mordecai refused it. When we're sensitive to the work of the Holy Spirit, sometimes it will include grief. When we are sensitive to the Holy Spirit, it will sometimes include grief. But when someone is sensing the need to confess a sin publicly, or someone begins to weep in that deep sorrow for sin, we want to close it. We want to cover it. We want to make them be okay. We want to comfort them. We want to make everything all right. We want to say, the Lord doesn't want you to be grieved. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes, it does say that, and it says nothing about you not grieving over your sin. When we're sensitive to the work of the Holy Spirit, sometimes it will include grief. And so when we say that to people, the Lord will just heal you, not realizing that the grief is part of the confession. Grief is part of the confession. Being serious about the confession. Mordecai said, you won't talk me out of it. You cannot, you can't do it. Esther learned the reason for the sackcloth and the ashes, and then we find Esther counting the cost. As soon as she finds out the reason for the grief, now she's saying, hmm, what will it mean for me to give my life? Let me put it in our words. What will it mean for me to give my life to Christ? You gotta count the cost. Am I willing to lay down my own life to live a life that reflects Jesus Christ? She says, I've not been called to the king's chambers. If I go there without invitation, I could be killed for it. God is looking for people today who will make eternal commitments. God is looking for people today to make eternal commitments. What do I mean? Commitment is a determination to die to self. Commitment is a determination to die to self. To die to our lusts, to die to our goals, to die to our own desires, and to live the resurrected life by the power of and under the direction of the Spirit of God. To live for something more. Our entrance into the king's presence demands death of self, but not destruction as we fear. Mordecai reminds Esther that her concern must go beyond herself and that her position, again, God positioning his people, of prominence is only a tool to bring salvation to her people. Deliverance is going to come to God's people with or without you, Esther. Many years ago, I was at a women's retreat. And at this women's retreat, they had, um, they had said, if you, you know, during the time of just reflection and just praying and we're worshiping, and they said, if you had get a word from the Lord, you know what I'm talking about when I say when you get a word from the Lord? Okay, everybody knows what I'm talking about there. Okay, so. 
I was, uh, if, you, if you get a word from the Lord, come up to the front to the microphone and share it. I was in, sitting in the back, and the Lord gave me a word. And I sat in the back, and I said, Lord, I don't want to go up. And I, don't want to, I, I don't want to go up to the front. I don't want to talk into the microphone. Would you give that word to someone else? And he did. He gave that exact word to the next woman that went up. The word will go whether or not I give it. But God wanted to use me. I missed out. I missed out. The people will not miss out because of me. We can refuse God's opportunity to be involved in his victory, but we will also be refusing the personal reward of maturity and blessing. But I did grow. Because the next time, I prayed ahead of time, don't make me go up to the microphone. (laughs) (laughs) So God being faithful, they said... Just stand up where you're at. (laughs) Hallelujah. Glory to God. He answered my prayer. Hallelujah. And I wanted to share that with all the people, but God said, no, that's not your business. business." So that's between you and me. So Esther has been been prepared for this moment all of her life, just like us. Does she know the final outcome? Of course not, because then it wouldn't be faith. We don't know it because it's faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. We don't see those things. And so this is the only chance she'll have. This opportunity is now, and she must choose. She must choose. The spirit will not always strive with our spirit. This could be her only opportunity. God gave me a second opportunity when I refused to go up to speak in the microphone. But this could be her last opportunity. It could be our last opportunity to say something when God tells us to say something. It could be our last opportunity to share with someone about Christ because we don't know. I do not know how many breaths I have left, and neither do you. And that person that you've been praying for, you don't know how many they have either. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Maybe it's the Jehovah's Witness that he wants you to share with. I was uh, walking with a friend on a little shopping trip, and a couple of Jehovah's Witnesses came up to us, which is unusual because they usually come to your door. So they came up to us, and the one gal started talking. And um, the one that I was with was a, a young Christian, and obviously this one, the Jehovah's Witness was also very young in what she was doing. And so she would say a verse, and I said, oh, yeah, well, in context, it says. I said, okay, so, so they, she went to the next verse. Okay, well, in, actually, in context, it actually says, la, 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 la. Okay, so, um, and then she comes up with another one. Well, yes, that is true. However, when you read the context of all of it's going on, At that point, the woman that was behind her steps up to talk to me. And she said, quite honestly, most people don't know the Bible that well. Don't let that be said of us. So that when truth is not being spoken, we don't challenge it. When someone says, thus saith the Lord, we better know that thus saith the Lord. 
Because if it goes against what God is saying, it's not thus saith the Lord. It's not truth. So we need to be reminded of that. So anyway, moving right along that, I don't know what that had to do with anything. Um, <laughs> other than it was time for a laugh, I'm just saying. Um, She might not have, this might be her only opportunity. That's what it came out of. Yes. <laughs> the Spirit has asked her to do something, and now she must respond. Has the Spirit of God asked you to do something, and you don't want to respond? I've had it in my life. I think we all have one time or another. But I challenge you right now, this very moment. Has God spoken something to you that you need to respond to? Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that you get into it. Today is the day that you deal with it. Today is the day that you say, let, let go of it. Today is the day that you move in the direction that the Holy Spirit is leading you. Today is the day. Not later this afternoon, not, not later tonight, not three weeks from now, not tomorrow. God wants you to deal with it right now. He wants you to deal with it in your heart right now. You've been challenged by what, what Sonia said. Right now, today is the day of salvation. Deal with whatever it is that God is speaking to you. I don't know what God's speaking to you. Again, I'm reminded that I am only responsible for what I say. I am not responsible for what you hear. <laughs> and what I mean by that, I've had people come up to me after I've taught, and they said, oh, that part about when, when you said blah, 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 blah. I go, I don't remember saying that. And I really don't remember saying that. And I didn't say that. But the Holy Spirit said that. So the Holy Spirit is responsible for what you hear. It's just like, it's kind of like the gift of speaking in tongues. Honestly, I'm saying one thing. You're hearing an interpretation of what I said because you're hearing something completely different than the words that I spoke. It's as if I were speaking in a different language and it had to be interpreted for you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, good, good. <laughs> wow, so, so in Acts 16, uh, so we have to respond. And we have to respond to the direction of the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit is telling us to do. In Acts 16, Paul wanted to go to Bithynia but the spirit said no, so we went, he went to Troas, and he waited there. There was a need for his ministry in Bithynia, but he was not called there at that time. He was not called there. I see a need, and I also need to know the call. I have known people who have been in ministry who were not called to the ministry. And I could tell that they weren't called to the ministry because they lived for something else besides the people. They lived for something else besides what God had called them to do. We have to be, we are there, we are there for each other. And that doesn't have to be just the pastor's wife, that doesn't have to just speak to the pastor, that speaks to each one of us. We are family. We are here for each other. We are always here for each other. And you got a friend. So <laughs> because of his willingness to follow the Holy Spirit, he received new vision, Paul, and he realized that Macedonia was open for such a time as this. He was right where he was supposed to be. Esther accepts the challenge all too often we see intercession only as words. She could have come up with a lot of words to make things happen.
but God calls us sometimes to something more. Intercession, yeah, I have a gift of intercessory prayer. Yes, I, not particularly me, but you know, we, we say, well, I have, a, I have a gift of intercession, intercessory prayer. So I pray for other people, I always pray for other people, and sometimes we need to look at that as more intercession, as more than just words of prayer. Many times intercession is standing in the gap for someone. In other words, being strength in their time of weakness. Providing food for the hungry rather than just promising to pray for it. When uh, Shannon was seven years old, she had an, uh, uh, an, appende- an emergency appendectomy. And there was just something about the, the situation that happened. I just... Um, I felt like I couldn't pray. I just, I didn't know what to say to God. I just, I, I, I don't know what happened at that point. But my friends interceded for me. It was my friends that were there to pray. It was my friends that were there to lift us up and to encourage us along the way. So Esther takes only what is her part to do. I heard somebody say, hmm. She only took what was her part to do. Okay, I'm, I can do it all. I can do it all. We're women. <laughs> we can do it all. We don't need no help. Thank you very much. I can handle this. You know what? When I was younger, I really could handle it, you know? But now, not so much. I used to climb up on the counter to get to the top of my cabinets. I can still climb up on the counter, (laughs) but I can't get down. (laughs) The times they are changing, (laughs) and everything about me is changing, and I have to depend on more on other people. And that's a hard thing for me. Do you find it hard to depend on other people? We sometimes find it hard to depend on the Lord because we judge the Lord by what we grew up with. And we think that he as a father is going to be just like my father or he is going to be just like my uncle, or he is going to be just like my other, whatever it is. No. God is for you. God is for you. He will never let you down. He will, when you are down, he will hold you. He will never let you down. You know, those words mean something. When I sing that song, he'll never let me down, I always think about them because there are times when we are let down. I'm really down. I, I'm, I'm just I'm disappointed. I'm just really. But God will never let us down because we are resting in his hands. And you just get that picture of just being a little tiny, those pictures of, who was it that, that did those little pictures of babies, you know, at, just in the hands of the, of the Lord. That's where we're at. No matter what your situation, that's where you're at. You are in the hands of the Lord. That uh, your goodness is running after me. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. What does that mean? Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. It says that the things that I have done, the person that I was, will show from behind, from where I have left. People will be encouraged People will be strengthened because I was walking with the Lord and shared with them as I was supposed to share with them. And I don't know where that came from or why that was said, 
but it must be for somebody. So, so she called on uh, all the others to be involved. Um, uh, oh, what she didn't do is she didn't do it all on her own. She didn't want to be a superstar. Even though her name meant star, she didn't want to be a superstar. <laughs> Esther recognizes that she's only one instrument in this cause. She's called upon all the others involved in this to do what they must do. So they all gather together. They all fast for her. They all pray for her. And um, prior to every move of God, there has been a demand for preparation. When we started the year 2020, I asked the Lord for a, uh, I asked the Lord for a scripture for every year. And the scripture for 2020 was Nahum 2.1, and this is not in my notes at all, but it was Nahum, Nahum Habakkuk, right? Uh, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. Yes. Okay, so Nahum 2.1, the beginning, January 1, the beginning of 2020, he who scatters has come up before your face. Man the fort, watch the road, strengthen your flanks, fortify your power mightily. January 1, 2020. By March 2020, we were being told to separate ourselves. From each other. He who scatters has come before your face. To separate us. So we will not be separated, but we have some work to do. Man the fort. Take care of your walls. Take care of the walls that are around you. Your protection. Make sure that you know the word of God. Make sure that you are fellowshipping with the Lord and with others. Man the fort, watch the road, pay attention to where you are walking. Pay attention to where you are. Strengthen your flanks. That means to strengthen the people that are along with you, and it also means to strengthen your flanks. Strengthen our bodies as much as we can. As you can see, mine's not very strong now. But as much as you can, we are to strengthen them and fortify your power mightily. Where does that power come from? That power comes from the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power for what? To become my witnesses. That's what God has called us to do. And that, so there's always been a demand for preparation. Only those who have completed the preparation receive the revelation. Only those who have completed the preparation receive the revelation. Esther calls for a three-day fast, declares her personal willingness to be involved, even to die if necessary. While Esther calls for the fast, it's Mordecai or the Holy Spirit at work who births the desire in the people to fulfill it. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to birth in us a desire for the Lord. So self or people-directed fasting provides little more than obedience and self-discipline. Self-directed, self or people-directed fasting provides little more than obedience and self-discipline. God-directed fasting adds to the spiritual victory. God-directed fasting adds to our spiritual victory. So Mordecai went away and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. What is the Holy Spirit directing you to do today? I think I already asked that question, didn't I? Yeah, so move on it. I got ahead of my notes. We're living in some very exciting times. We've been preparing for this situation all of our Christian lives. God has positioned us exactly where we are to be right now. God has you positioned where you are for a purpose, and we just need to seek him and allow the Holy Spirit to direct our lives so that we bring glory to his name. And who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. 
I want to leave you with this scripture, Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60, starting with verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth. I want you to pay attention to that. Behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness will cover the people. But, but the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. No fear here. God has got this. So let's...